the background for chapter 9. So that's what, that's what we're going to look at uh, this morning. So as we turn to the word of the Lord, I want to remind you of something. We looked at just at the beginning, um, or we looked at just at the end last week, uh, two weeks ago, when we were finishing up talking about, um, about Saul uh, and what Saul was saying about his own life. And I want to remind you of some verses from things he writes about in his own life, especially as we prepare today to go to the park. Look with me at 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. And um, uh, Andres and I are going to work together on this one. I'm gonna, I'll do the best I can, but he's going to do most of it. I'll do some of it. Saul, Paul, in talking about his old life, says this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Today when we go into the park, let this be emblazoned in your thoughts and in your mind as we go out. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. As we go today, as we go to share, some people will be happy to, to hear it. Some people won't want to hear it. But what you do and what I do as we go today is we know this. This is why Christ Jesus came. Sometimes we, we, we adjust what we do or we stop, we, we stop what we're doing or, or whatever based on the response that people may give us. Um, people may not want to hear or people may think, ah, I don't care for this. But what you can know today as you go forth, and we hope each one of you is going with us to the park. If you're not, the, the same, is still the it, same is still true. But what you can know is this. As we go today to share Jesus in whatever way, some of us are going to give food, home-baked goodies. Some of us are going to paint faces. Some of us are going to do puppet shows. Some of us are going to share directly. Some of us are going to be blowing up balloons. But all that we're doing is to share the love of Jesus and to share the truth of Jesus in creative ways. And what you can be assured of and what I can be assured of is this as we go today. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So as we go forth today, what you know is this. What you are doing and what I'm doing perfectly, perfectly aligns with the purposes of Jesus Christ. That should encourage you this morning. That should encourage you. What we're doing is the heart of Jesus. And then Paul speaking of his own life. This is 1 T Timothy 1. And so this is near the end of his life. This is the next to the last letter he wrote. Um, and his, his death is not a long way off. Um, but he says, as he looks back, and he says, and I am the worst of them all. We're going to meet some people today in the park that are going to feel, if you start to share with them about Jesus or, and righteousness or church or whatever, however you share, I promise you, there are people that you're going to talk with this morning that are going to feel, I'm the worst of them all. Yes? For sure, for sure. Some of you have felt, I'm the worst of them all as well. And Paul looks back on his life and he says, I'm the worst of them all. I'm the worst of them all. So as I said la the last time we talked about it, you may feel you're the worst of them all. You may talk with people who feel, I'm the worst sinner of them all. But we can only be assistant worst sinners. Paul says, I'm the worst of them all because of what he, because of what he did. And I want you to think about this. So Paul says, I'm the worst of them all. But at one point, Saul thought he was the best of them all, didn't he? He thought, I am it. I'm, I, there's nobody more righteous than I am. May I say something to you this morning? You may be sitting here this morning. We are certainly, you're probably going to meet people in the park today or throughout this who are going to feel and they may say to you, I'm good. There's no doubt about that. Just as Saul felt. I'm the best of them all. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm a Jew of the Jews. I'm, a be I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I am this, I am this, I am this, I am this. And it took an encounter with Jesus to see I'm not the best of them all. I am this instead. And as we share Jesus today, listen, brothers and sisters, you don't have to say to anybody, but you're really bad. 
generally speaking, that's not a great way to make bridges with people and share Jesus with them, okay? Let the Holy Spirit do that. Let the Holy Spirit do that. That's His job. What Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes into the world, He will convict the world of what? Sin and righteousness and judgment. Those three things. That's His work. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to be full of the Holy Spirit as we go, right? And so Paul says, I'm the worst of them all, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. So if you come across somebody today or in the days ahead who say, I can't, I've done too much, my life is too bad, you can tell them about the man named Paul who at one time murdered Christians with great delight, with great zeal. And you can talk about the patience and the love of God for such a terrible person. And Paul looked at his own life and he said, but he could use me as a prime example of his great patience. Then others in the future, I'm pretty excited about that. This may be that day. Then others in the future will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You may meet some people today <clears throat> that fall into that category, amen? Amen. Amen. And so let this encourage you as you go today. God is patient. God is powerful. No heart is too hard for him, though it may take some hard circumstances. You know, we look at this, and Paul doesn't say anything about Stephen, the martyr, that he had a great hand in, in, uh, in killing, in murdering. But I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to see the truth of all of it. And almost all commentators believe that the death and that the martyrdom of Stephen had a great impact on the life of Saul. And so as we go forth today, may, you're not, by the way, you're not going to get martyred in Kowloon Park, okay? <laughs> you're not, nobody's going to get martyred in Kowloon Park. May I say to you, the worst thing that may happen to you today and to me today is somebody may laugh at us. Honestly, somebody may laugh at us. Somebody may say, oh, you're one of those religious kooks or one of those crazies or whatever. So what? So what? Don't let that discourage you. If anybody were to have looked at that encounter with Stephen and Saul, initially we would absolutely have said, what a disaster for Stephen. What a disaster for Jesus. Look at that. Saul won. Stephen gave up his life. But it was not a long time later that Saul himself was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so as we think about that, we go forth this day. Then we go on a little bit further. And I want to remind you of what we looked at. In Acts 9.15, the Lord said to Ananias, this is as he was, as he was being converted, um, as, pa as Paul Saul was being converted, and as God was calling him, the Lord said to Ananias, who was this Christian living in Damascus, we don't know that he was a leader, we don't know a lot about him, I'm going to talk about him a little bit more in just a minute. The Lord said to Ananias, go for Saul is my chosen instrument. He's my chosen instrument. Now we talked about this already. So we know that what the Lord says is, he is my chosen instrument to do this, 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 and this. And we've all agreed that Saul's life immediately, it fit with God's call on his life. But I want you to see something this morning. What I want you to see is, the Lord says, Saul is my chosen instrument to do this. And what I want to remind us of this morning is that each one of us is also a chosen instrument. You are a chosen instrument. What is that word instrument again? What does it mean? Do you remember? I know it's two weeks ago now, or maybe three weeks ago now. Let me remind you. It means literally, as in this case, it means a what? A vessel. That's one of the meanings. That's one of the primary meanings. It's a vessel. And it is a vessel, so that's that beautiful meaning. We are vessels. Saul was a vessel. What was inside the vessel? Jesus was inside the vessel. The empowering of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, the power to transform a murderer into the number one evangelist and church planter in the history of, in, in mankind's history. So 
a chosen vessel. But I want to encourage you a little bit further this morning because you and I look at Saul and we think, yeah, but he was special. Yes, he was special because he was called to do something specific that you and I are not called to do. But we too are chosen vessels and what you are called to do is different from what Saul was called to do. What I'm called to do is a little bit different than what you're called to do. Why? Because I'm different. The outside part, I'm different than you are. I'm different. I, my upbringing is different than yours. My training is different than yours. My gifts are different than yours. You are different than I am. So the vessel on the outside is different. But what is inside of us is the same, brothers and sisters. What is inside of us is the transforming power of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever and forever. That is the, that's what makes the difference. So we're different on the outside, but we're sa the same on the inside because Jesus is on the inside. And so the Lord said to Ananias, go, you go talk to Saul. You go lay hands on him. You get, go pray for him because he's my chosen instrument. But you too are a chosen instrument. And I want us to go back to the Old Testament this morning. And let's look very briefly at what David writes about being chosen by God. From Psalm 139, one of my favorite Psalms. Let's look at Psalm 139. And this is a beautiful, oh, maybe one time we'll come back to this and look at some, um, we'll look at some other things. But I want us to look at Psalm 1, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead, right? Sorry, Galatians first. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, there we go, thank you. First of all, so Saul says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. But look at this, this wonderful, we'll get to Psalm 139 in just a minute. He says, but even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. That is amazing to me. That's amazing to me. And it should be amazing to you as well. Because we look at ourselves as we are, and we look at our limitations, and we look at what we cannot do, right? We look at, well, I'm, I'm limited. I'm this or I'm that. Saul said, God chose me before I was born. Before I was born. Guess what? God chose you before you were born also. You say, well, I may not feel, but I don't feel that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We've been chosen by God. You say, are you sure of that? Yes, I am. Now let's look at Psalm 139. At the next passage, look at, what Dave, look at what David writes. In Psalm 139, this beautiful, beautiful passage about the workmanship of God. We look at creation and we think, oh, it's so wonderful. We look at the night sky and we think it's so beautiful. We look at, at animals and other things and we think, oh, it's so lovely. The most wonderful work of God is sitting here this morning in chairs. And we're going to meet them this afternoon in Cowlin Park. And David says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Hey, do some of you feel like you're not worth very much this morning? Have you been told, eh, you're a nobody? Have you been told your life doesn't really count for a lot because you haven't done this or you haven't done that? Have you ever been told or were you told as a child or were you uncounted as a child? Were you unloved as a child? Were you told I'm a mis you're a mistake? Were you told I don't want you or even if you weren't told that, did you feel that? Let me tell you something this morning. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You go to Psalm 139 and look at the words that David was inspired to write. Look at what he says. God set his eyes upon you before you even drew your first breath. It says, God knit you together in your mother's womb. You were remarkably and wonderfully made. Whatever others have said about you, what other, whatever others may think about you, whatever the world's estimation or value of, of you is. May I tell you something? Today as we go out into the park, there are going to be some people you are going to meet who will feel my life doesn't count for much. I'm not worth much. It may be because of their upbringing. It may be because of their background. It may be because of things that have happened to them. Because a lot of people have gone through this life and they are broken and they are bruised and they're hurt by what has happened to them and they think, well, I'm only worth this much. May I say to you, this is what God says about your life. May I say to you that God looks at you and he valued you enough to give Jesus for your life. 
And David says, My bones were, were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Now, look at this. You say, how does this fit with what, with what you're talking about, with God choosing me and God's plan for me? Look at verse 16. You saw me, or your eyes saw me, when I was formless. All my days, uh, this is a different, uh, uh, there's some different translations. Every day of my life, was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Let me read you another translation. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Listen, in an hour and a half or so, you and I are going to walk out into Kowloon Park. Guess what? Before you were born, God planned this day for you. How about that? Amen. How about that? You're going to meet some people in that park today. How about this? God planned for you to meet them. God's going to equip you and empower you to say words to that person. He's going to prompt your heart, and you're going to say something and share something. You think, oh, well, I, I hadn't planned to share that. But God planned this day. And every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God chose you. God chose you. And God chose me. Just as God had a plan and a calling for Paul's life, God has a plan and a calling for your life. Let me say one thing this morning, because I know we have some visitors here this morning. You are hearing this this morning, and this may sound pretty good to you. You say, God has a plan for my life? Wow. I didn't, I haven't heard that before. Yes, God has a plan for your life. Do you want to know what it is? You find out God's plan for your life by entering into a relationship with Him. And as you get to know God and enter a relationship with Him, God will show you the plan that He has for your life. God's plan for you is better than the plan that your parents had for you. All oh, parents that who are sitting here this morning, if I were to ask you, parents, what do you want for your for your kids' life? What is your wish for your kids? What would you tell me? You might tell me all sorts of things. You might tell you might tell me I want them to do well in school. I want them to grow up and do this. I want them to be healthy. I want them all of these things. And you'd have great plans for your child's life. Do you know that God has a better plan than you have? Better. Better than the plan that you have. And every one of us sitting here this morning, God has a better plan for your life than you have for yourself. How do I know that? Because the Bible says He made you. He knows you better than you know you. And because He made you, and because He knows you, He knows what will fulfill you. He knows what will take everything that you are and every gift that you have and use it for good purposes. This is what God will do in your life. But it comes through relationship with Him. It comes through relationship with Him. Paul says something else about God's workmanship and God's plan as well. Look at Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. So it said, He has created us, He has made us. And then we look at Ephesians 2.10 and Paul says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, another translation says, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. do are we having some problems with the whatever? Uh, we're in New King James, uh, and I should have New Living Translation. Is that? Yeah. We're, I think we're out of, we're out of my... We're out of my, uh... okay, there we go. For we're God's masterpiece. Oh, you're a masterpiece. You say, oh, I don't feel like a masterpiece. What, you're going to tell God he's a liar? You're going to argue with him? Okay, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us and you in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Just think, brothers and sisters, God planned this day long ago when we walk out into the park. He has planned some good things for you and for, and for me. So, as we look at this and as we think about this, we have focused on Paul, Saul, 
and we're going to talk about him a little bit more. We're going to talk about Peter just a little bit more as well. But you saw the title of this, and I told you that we were going to talk about some of the men behind the scenes. But to get to the men behind the scenes, we're going to go through a little more of Saul, and we're going to look at a little bit more of Peter. And I want you to think with me for just a minute um, about Ananias. And we're going to talk about him for just a minute. Here is Saul. God has called him on the road to Damascus. He is called of God. He is chosen of God. He's going to do great things for God. And God chooses somebody else. God chooses Ananias to go talk to Saul. And what I want us to look at is this. God did not have to use Ananias to reach Saul, to reach Paul. Because we already know on the road Jesus revealed himself. We already know that Jesus himself could have opened Saul's eyes. But instead, he then points to somebody in Damascus, a man named Ananias. And we don't know a lot about Ananias, except we know that he was a man of faith. We know that he was devout. We know that he followed the law. And we know that he had a good reputation. So you know what that tells me? That doesn't tell me anything about his gifts, that doesn't tell me anything about he was a great preacher or a great leader. What that tells us is, that tells us something about his life, right? That tells us something about what kind of person Ananias was. Not that he was a preacher. Not that he was a speaker. Not that he was an evangelist. He was a Christian. And he was a faithful follower of God. Just as I hope you and I are this morning as well. There was a good work that God planned in advance for Ananias to do. What if Ananias had said, Oh no, God, not me, send somebody else. In fact, he sort of said that at first, right? Oh, but God, that guy, he was a murderer. And God says, No, you go. And Ananias goes. He felt, listen carefully, Ananias felt he was not able. How many of you right now, please be honest, how many of you feel right now, as we go out into the park today, you kind of feel, even though you've studied the four points, okay, here's the bracelet. Do you have your bracelets? That's the easy part, okay? You say, oh, I forgot my bracelet. Doomed! That's okay, we've got some more, okay? It's okay. You've got the bracelets. You've looked at the videos. How many of you still feel, I'm not really able? How many of you still feel, kind of, right? Okay, a few of us are honest this morning. Guess what? You're in good company. Ananias also felt he wasn't able. But what Ananias was, was available. Okay? So he didn't feel able, but he was available. And because he was available, God enabled him and made him able. That's, that's what enabled means. I'm, I'm repeating words, okay? You, you understand. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make the point. So you may feel, I'm not able. What if somebody asks me a question I don't know how to answer? How many of you are thinking that? Somebody's going to ask me a question in the park. Okay, there you go. Thank you for your honesty. Somebody's going to ask me a question and I don't know how to answer. Well, I may not know how to answer either, but God is able. God is able. What we do is we make ourselves available. I've told you this before, but I want to just give you a practical example of, of this. Many years ago, you all know that I lived in China and I worked in China for many years. And as I was in China, uh, I, would, I, I talked with my students. I was teaching English, but I was sharing Jesus whenever I could. And I was in the dining hall at Peking University, at, at, at Beijing University. This is many, many years ago now, probably almost 30 years ago now. And somebody came up to me, and she knew me by reputation, and so she knew I was a Christian. She wasn't one of the young students. I think she was a graduate student or somebody like that, but she was not one of my students. She came up behind me in the dining hall, and she started talking to me, and the first thing she did was she at almost the first thing she did was she asked me a question about Jesus okay and when she asked me a question about Jesus I've told you this before but I'll tell it to you again in case you have if in case you've forgotten or you don't or you haven't heard this before my response to her was to dismiss her I dismissed her I wasn't rude 
but I just, in my, in, in my thinking, I thought, somebody who just wants to practice their English. I really did. I really did. I'm being very honest with you, because people always wanted to practice English. And I thought, well, she doesn't even know who, my, who I am, and I'll bet she just knows, oh, you know, talk to a foreigner, ask them about Jesus, they'll always talk about Jesus, you know? And so she asked me something about, oh, how can I, how can I get to know Jesus? And I dismissed her. To my shame, I dismissed her. And I kind of, oh, whatever, and sort of brushed her off. A week later, there was a knock at my door. And she had, she, we had met, so she knew, and she knew where I lived on the campus. There was a knock at my door, and it was this young lady. And I opened the door, and I thought, she's found me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did. She's found me. But her face was shining. You know what she said to me before anything else? She looked at me and she said, I went to church on Sunday and I've become a Christian. <laughs> true, true conversion. She wanted to meet Jesus. And to my shame, I dismissed her. I dismissed her. I could have been the chosen instrument to share Jesus with that young lady who wanted to meet Jesus. But I thought, yeah, right. She wants to practice English. If we get to it, and we may not this morning, because I, I know our time is short, you know, Ananias could have missed the opportunity for Saul. He could have, right? He could have said, huh, he's not really converted. It's a, it's a, it's a lie. He's just doing it to try to get more Christians. Barnabas, a little bit later, when they go to Jerusalem, Barnabas could have said what all of the other Christians in Jerusalem said, because after Saul is converted, and a few years later he goes to Jerusalem, I'm, I'm talking ahead because I think we're not going to get there this morning. Do you know what it says a little bit later? It says that when Saul went to Jerusalem, he tried repeatedly, he was there for about 15 days, for about two weeks, he tried repeatedly to associate with the Christians, including people like Peter and the leaders. He tried to associate with them, but everybody was afraid of him because they remembered what he had been. They remembered his history. And then the Bible says, but Barnabas, the son of encouragement, went to Saul and saw, took him to the leaders and told him this is what has happened to Saul. Barnabas put himself on the line. And because of that, Barnabas had a hand in the life of Saul and Paul. Because of that, Ananias had a part in the life of Saul. You and I, all God calls us to do is to make ourselves available. All God calls us to do. I told you that story. It's, it's one of my great re regrets of China. It really is. It's one of my great regrets. Because it could have been one of my greatest joys. That would have been so easy, right? It would have been so easy. But I lost that. I lost that. Thank the Lord that she persevered and that she met Jesus. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. What you and I do is make ourselves available. And God enables us. God enables us. Think of the effect of one man, Ananias, because after this point, Ananias disappears from the scene. Uh, Andreas, I'm going to let you click these parts. I want to ask you if you've ever heard, I'm going to give you a few names and I'm going to ask you if you, if you can get it there. I'll try, here we go. I'll try to do it. Here we go. I'm going to ask you if you've ever heard of this man. His name is, let me see if I can pronounce it because I'm not really German, Johann Staupitz. How many of you have you heard of this man before? Johann Staupitz. Well, I hadn't either until I, until I started digging around. And the man who was influenced by him said, had it not been for Dr. Staupitz, I would have sunk in hell. Do you know who said that? Martin Luther the great reformer of the church. We've heard of Martin Luther before, haven't we? Yes. Wow! But had it not been for this man that you and I have never heard of before, right? We've never heard. An unnamed person. But he influenced Martin Luther. And think about what Martin Luther did. Okay, let me give you another name. I'll, I know you've never heard of this one before. <laughs> and you say, well, we haven't seen him before either. Sorry, uh, pardon my poor artwork. Um, 
His name is John Eglin, and the reason I blanked out his face is because there are no pictures of him recorded in history. <laughs> no, no, ha! You, you say, oh, clever, Pastor Dan. Let me read you. One Sunday in, on January 6th, 1850, John Eglin of Colchester, or Col I don't know how to pronounce that, Colchester, there we go, awoke to a town buried in snow. He almost stayed home, but as a faithful deacon, he walked six miles through the snow to the Methodist church where he was a member. That day, even the pastor did not make it. Indeed, only 13 people showed up, 12 members and one visitor a 13-year-old boy. Some of them suggested, let's all go home, but Eglin refused. After all, they had a visitor, but who would preach? Eglin was the one who preached. But later on, he said he was a very poor preacher, and he was. And the person who was influenced also said he was a very poor preacher, and he was. He preached for only 10 minutes, and it was far from elegant. The text was Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Gathering his courage, Eglin looked straight at the visitor and said, Young man, look to Jesus. Look, look, look. The boy did look and was saved at that moment. Who was that young boy? Spurgeon the great evangelist, Charles Spurgeon. And Spurgeon himself later talks about that, that morning, that snowy morning, because that wasn't even his church. He was going somewhere else, but the snow was falling, and to escape the snow, he ran into this church, and there he was for a 10-minute sermon. Listen, there are going to be some people in that park that are there to get out, to get away from work, to cool off to whatever, and they may not even want to hear your sermon, your sermon, quote unquote. You may be far from elegant, right? Your sermon may not be any better than John Eglin's was that morning. Look, look, look. But the power is not in you. The power is in Jesus Christ. You and I may not be famous in this world, but who knows what God can do through us. One more. Have you ever heard of this man before? And I had not, and some of you may have before. His name is Mordecai or Mordecai Ham. Now, some of you may have heard of him before. Who's he? Anybody heard of him before? He's the evangelist who was preaching the night a young, skinny American man heard the gospel and responded. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Brothers and that's kind of great, isn't it? That's kind of encouraging, isn't it? And now you all said great, and then none of you said encouraging. It should be encouraging. It should be encouraging. It really should. It really should. I, I was so encouraged when I, when, I, when I was looking at this and when I read these things because some of these people, they are nameless. And I mean, what do we know about Ananias? He lived in Damascus and he was this. We don't know anything else about him. What does this word proving mean? It's a very simple word. And you say, but I can't prove. I'm not a, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a whatever. May I, may I tell you very simply what this word means? The word prove here means to take things from various places and to bring them together. That's what it means. So as we share Jesus, there are things that you know about the Bible, but you don't know everything about the Bible, right? But there are things in your own life as well. Yes? Yes. What has Jesus done for you? And so what you and I are going to do as we share today and in the days ahead is this. We are going to prove that Jesus is the Messiah by our lives. You may share something from the Bible. You may share something from your own life. You may share something from somebody else as well by taking things from different areas, bringing it together, and then sharing it. Now, we're going to keep on going from here because I want us to look at Peter and then we're going to finish up with that. I'm going to bring end you with a final encourage, encouragement this morning. In the section that we're going to skip, if you will follow it, you will find that in Damascus, Saul has attempt number one on his life. 
because he preaches so powerfully. By the way, you are not going to have an attempt on your life in Kowloon Park today, okay? Again, people may laugh at you, but nobody's going to try to kill you today, okay? <laughs> so be bold and be very courageous. Then he goes to Jerusalem. Saul goes to Jerusalem. Guess what? He preaches so powerfully in Jerusalem that there is attempt number two on his life in Jerusalem. You are not, as I said again, nobody's going to try to kill you in Kowloon Park today, okay? Be bold, be strong, and be courageous as we go forth. And the brothers in Jerusalem are so upset by what happens, they want to preserve Saul's life, and they send him back off to his hometown. I kind of wonder if they thought, hi-ya, because he was stirring up so much with his powerful preaching. So as we say goodbye to Saul, there are two attempts on his life. So as we close, let's go on to Peter in the last parts of the chapter. And what happens, here's the other great character in this chapter, and we look at uh, Acts, uh, slide, slide 9, Acts 9, 32 through 35. Peter traveled from place to place, and he came down to visit the saints in the town of Lydda. And we're going to go very quickly through this because now we have one, two minutes left, okay? So stay with me as we come to a conclusion this morning. But what I want you to see is this. He goes to the town of Lydda, he preaches the gospel, and in the town of Lydda, you can go ahead and click that, he met a man named Aeneas, and he met Aeneas, and he says to him, and Aeneas is paralyzed, he's been bedridden for eight years, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Here's this beautiful thing, what, he, what it means is, right now, Jesus Christ is healing you. You can trust and expect the Lord to work as you share today. Amen. Not something way off in the future. As you share, you can trust the Lord. You say, but, but what if I meet somebody crippled in the park? I don't think I'm able to pray for them. I don't know, whatever. Listen, you're not responsible to figure out what you're supposed to do. That's the Holy Spirit's job, right? He's going to lead us. He's going to lead us. And so he says, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, roll up your sleeping mat. Peter couldn't have, Peter couldn't do that. He was a, what was it? He was a vessel. He was a vessel. It was Jesus in him that did it. Aeneas is healed, and many people, many people receive the Lord. So there's the result. The whole population of Lydda and Sharon, that's an area, saw Aeneas walking around, and they turned to the Lord. And then it doesn't stop there. We go next. Then a little bit further away, there was a believer in Joppa. I want you to remember Lydda and Joppa, named Tabitha or Dorcas. She was a saint in the church. She dies. Her body is washed for burial, but the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda, and they sent two men. Please, come as soon as possible. They were not calling Peter to come preach a funeral service, were they? No. They weren't asking for the great pre preacher Paul, hey, we want you to preach this funeral. No. Here's the great thing about the work of God. When God begins to do something great in somebody's life, guess what happens? It begins to spread, and when it begins to spread, hope stirs in the hearts of hopeless people. Hope stirs in hopeless situations. That's the wonderful thing. That's going to happen today. That's going to happen tomorrow. When God does something wonderful in one life, it spreads. It always spreads. It always spreads. And they hear that Peter is nearby at Lydda, and they have heard that Aeneas was raised up. There's no question about it. This is a town that's very close by, and it says the whole area heard. And so they send two men, and they say, quickly, go get Peter. So Peter comes. He comes to the room. He prays. He has seen Jesus do this. He kneels down, and he prays, and he turns to the body. Oh, no, 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 Pastor Jennifer. I can't pray for anybody who's dead. That's not your responsibility. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. But listen, listen. You're going to meet people today and tomorrow and the next day who are spiritually dead also. The great thing about Tabitha was she was going to heaven. She was a believer. She was a saint, and she was raised back up to physical life. There's something more wonderful than physical resurrection, and it is spiritual resurrection. It's spiritual resurrection. But Peter prays, he helps her up, he calls in the widows, he presented, and then what does it say? The news spread, and again, 
Many believed in the Lord, and Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. But that's not where I want to end. Here's where we end this morning. Have you heard of Lydda before? Have you heard of Joppa before? You say no, but actually you have. Because these are the towns that Philip passed through. You say, Philip? Well, he was in chapter 8. That's right. Remember I said pay attention to this? Philip went to Azotus there. And then the Bible says he went up the towns of the coast. There's Lydda. There's Joppa until he arrived in Caesarea. Why were there believers in Lydda? Philip passed through their preaching. Why were there believers in Joppa? Because Philip passed through their preaching. Brothers and sisters, as we come to a close today, we've looked at the giants, Peter and Paul, but there are a lot of people who are not Peter and Paul that are still chosen of God for his instruments. You are such a one. I am such a one. And we've looked at some of the results that happened because of Ananias, because of Barnabas because of Philip. So I'm going to invite you this morning to stand. S to stand. <laughs> and we're going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Renee as we finish up. And I invite you just to join me. Just do it any way you want to, but I encourage you, maybe you want to hold your hands out and just present yourself. You don't feel able at all. Some of you feel very able this morning. Honestly, I don't feel very able, even myself. But you want to present yourself to him this morning and say, Lord, I don't feel able, but I am available. Are you available? Yes. Okay, then. Lord, here we are this morning. God, we don't see ourselves as Peter's and Paul's. Lord, we're a little bit scared. But Lord, we are available. God, Ananias was scared, too. I am, too. But Lord, I'm available. I'm available to be your vessel. I'm available to be your chosen instrument for the good work that you have planned for me to do today. Here I am. And tomorrow and the day after that as well. Here I am, Lord. I'm available. Would you fill me with yourself that you might do the, the things that you have planned to do, that I might do all the good work that you have planned for me to do this day. I want to share you. Lord, I want to be able I want to be able because you have enabled me to do what you want me to do today as I walk out into that park or with my family or with others as well. And so, Lord, here we are. Lord, if, we are fam if we're in families this morning, parents, present your children to the Lord and your young people to the Lord this morning. Lord, we present our children and our young people to you this morning. If you're not able to go to the park today, you may be going to work after this or you may have to go on to other things. Present yourself to him anyhow this morning and see what he will do with your life as you make yourself available, just as Ananias and Barnabas and Philip. Lord, here we are. Do your work. May we be your instruments, chosen by you and available for you to enable us for every good work. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.